Um, I want to go ahead and introduce Rupert Isaacson. Um, I know when uh, in January we're looking for somebody to um, come in and um, speak here and somebody that's uplifting and motivating. And I happened to see the movie The Horse Boy, and I fell in love with the movie. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just see if he would respond to an email. And sure enough, two hours later, he did. And so I was very excited that he was able to come and be here with us and share his story and his journey and experiences. So I, Rupert Isaacson, please welcome him with an open mind and an open heart. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, it's not the kind of um, request one gets every day. And I feel very humble because I'm usually on the other side of the, um, of the coin, if you like. As an autism dad, I frequently am out there talking to non-special needs families about what the experience is to be a special needs um, parent and um, how you take that adventure and so on. And so it's a great honor to be here with you guys um, because there's a lot for me to learn here. Um, and um, as I've been learning a little bit more about the 1P36 um, way of being, I see what an incredibly beautiful um, way of being it is for, for, the, for the children and um, young adults who are involved in it and the families too. And it's something that I'd really like to explore further. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very curious about it. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of my story, um, but my son Rowan was diagnosed with autism in 2004. And um, I had, like probably everyone in this room, I had no background, I had no training, I had no preparation for any sort of special needs thing. It just pops up in your life, doesn't it? And then you sit there scratching your head trying to figure it out. And Although I'm British, as you can hear from my accent, I do live in Texas. I live not far away on a ranch uh, just outside of Austin. But my extent, all the extended family, my parents live in London. And um, uh, Rowan's mum, her, her parents live, one of them's in Seattle, one of them's in Denmark. So there wasn't any babysitting support. There wasn't any backup. There were no aunts and uncles. There was nothing like that. And none of our friends could really cope with our son. So there was no babysitting because he tantrumed all the time. He was completely incontinent. Um, he was high maintenance babysitting, you could say. And um, because of that, we found ourselves in this position of isolation. And I think that's one of the things which I love about seeing this event here, is I know some of you have come an awful long way, probably with some rather challenging adventures on the way. Um, has anyone come from outside of the USA here? Where have you come from, man? Can you shout it loudly so someone can... Mexi Mexico. Mexico. Amazing. I take my hat off to you. Anyone else come from outside? Yes. Canada. Got... You should have brought us a little cool weather. Where in Canada? Funny, we were just uh, we were just in Ontario doing a training of horse boy method. Anyone else from outside of the USA? Anyone from outside of Texas? Forest of hands. You guys are all um, heroes. I, as a special needs dad, I mean, I have done transatlantic flights sitting in the toilet of the airplane trying to console, you know, contain my son's tantrums. I've been the guy getting up and saying to everyone, I'm going to buy all of you a drink within five rows of here because this flight's going to be hell and I'm the one causing the hell. I formally apologize before the plane takes off the ground. The drinks are on me. <laughs> and everybody accepted. Um, it's not easy. We know this. And what's equally not easy is that when we then go out in public, um, and our kids don't necessarily behave like everyone else's kids do. You know, how many times have I had a complete stranger come up to me in the supermarket and tell me what a terrible parent I am? Or give me just that sort of eye that they give you and so on. And I, I think back to myself 15 years ago 
I might have done the same thing out of ignorance. It's not that people are necessarily wrong or bad, it's just that they don't know. And if we don't come together and find community and educate each other, we can't really expect the wider world to. But one thing that we do know is that special needs is on the rise. Autism alone, it's now one child in 88 over the age of 8 years old. And it's one boy in 56 over the age of 8 years old. When I was a boy, it was two children in 10,000. Something is going on. It's not just a question of better diagnosis. There's clearly something changing environmentally. That's what all the science is pointing to. But whatever the reasons, everybody, all of us in this room, know that this is the reality that we're dealing with. And we're dealing with a changing world. And it's going to affect how business is done. It's going to affect how the world of employment looks 20 years hence, when a lot of our kids grow up and enter the workforce. And they will enter the workforce. Because things are changing, and technology is changing, and things are much more possible now than they were 20 years ago. I know a non-verbal guy who's not toilet trained who publishes poetry. And it's published, and he gets royalties for it. Um, I know another writer who's completely non-verbal, not toilet trained, who's, who's, who's a very well-published writer at this point. Things are not where they used to be. So I think we can take a lot of hope from this. But what we also know is that we need to, the only way we can do this is to find community and to live one day at a time. We're not the kind of people anymore who say, oh, I'm this kind of person and I would only do this with my life. Or I'm that, I would never do that. All of those rules have changed. For us, all of our lives have been turned on their heads. And it's a good thing because it's split our hearts wide open. And we are better people, bigger hearted people more intelligent people as a result of this adventure. So before I go on and tell you a little bit more about my adventure, I do want to, all of you to put your hands together for yourselves, please, for being the kind of heroes you are. There is an ethic which um, Rowan's mum, Kristen, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Texas has gotten down to a fine art. She's a, de a developmental psychology professor and her field of research is the nexus where Buddhism and mainstream psychology come together. And she specializes in the study of people's ability to be compassionate towards themselves and how this affects their positive and negative mental health. She's got plenty of opportunity to explore this, obviously. You guys, too. It's very, very important. We tend to feel we're brought up in a culture where we're told that the only way we're going to motivate ourselves to be successful and the only way we're going to motivate ourselves to put in the kind of effort that we need in life is to be constantly self-critical. And when we're dealing with the kinds of challenges that we're dealing with, that can grind us into the ground. It's not practical. It's no longer useful for us to, you see I'm wearing spurs because I train horses. If we're constantly spurring ourselves like this, we're actually not going to last the course. We're thinking 60 years, 70 years trajectory. Beyond death, we're thinking, how are we going to set up mechanisms for our families, for our children after we go? This is foremost in our minds. The only way we're going to do this is if we learn to be compassionate towards ourselves. So when I asked you to put your hands together for yourself, I want you to do one more thing. It's a touchy-feeling thing, and you're going to think I'm nuts. But it's a good tool. Take your hands out in front of you. Go on, do it. And give yourselves a hug. And say something nice to yourself. Say something nice to yourself as if you were a good friend of yourself. Not your inner critic telling you what an idiot you are. Your good friend telling you, you really gave that a good try. Well done. Okay, maybe it didn't work this time. It will work next time. Obviously, if we go around hugging ourselves, people are going to think we're nuts. And the chaps in white coats are going to come along and probably cart us off to the funny farm. 
So if you want to do it by self, here's a very useful thing. Take your hands now like this. You can be talking to somebody. Mm, yeah, absolutely, huh? Mm, yeah, I'm a terrible parent. Mm, absolutely. And you just hold yourself like this, and it looks a bit more normal. All right, so normal isn't the universe that any of us inhabit anymore. Normal is something we're having to let go of. Thank goodness. Because normal, quite frankly, is boring. Who on earth wants to be normal? Who on earth ever got anywhere real in the world by being normal? Normal is something that other people want you to do so that you don't make them feel bad about the fact that they're not doing something interesting. And human communities can do this. We can pull each other back a little bit. I think that when you get the special needs diagnosis as a parent, it's a carte blanche, a free ticket from God to do whatever you want to do on one condition, provided it's in service to your child. If it's in service to your child and you have a dream that you want to fulfill, you must do it. Not tomorrow. Thank you. It's what our kids need us to do. You don't want to be the kind of child that sees your parents just living in fear and doing what everybody else does. You want to see your parents forge your head to the front and show you that it's possible to make dreams happen so that your dreams as a child have some validity. And you know as the kid, oh, if I have this dream, I can make it happen because look at mum and dad. They're already doing it. And mum and dad listen to my dreams too. When I talk about the urgency of this stuff, I spend a lot of my life on horseback. When you live a lot of your life on horseback, there is this thing called gravity which kicks in from time to time. You're up here, and occasionally you go down there. And occasionally you go down there in situations that you didn't quite bargain for. Last year this happened to me. And I was jumping a horse over a fence. And it was rider error. I came in at the wrong angle. And the horse hit the fence. And he flipped a somersault in midair. And he landed on top of me. Off to hospital. Metal rod through the leg. That was all fine. In the recovery room, they overdosed me on morphine. Straight down the tunnel. Lovely conversation with God. God's an excellent bloke, by the way. Um, so, and I can thoroughly recommend going down the tunnel. Everyone should do it. Everybody will. It's just good. I can also report no nasty surprises on the other side. Everything very lovely. One of the things I got told while I was there was this. Our experience of life, the universe, if you like, life here as we know it, is a grand experiment. It's an experiment in love. And the universe is like a hive or like a termite mound, if you like, and the made of love. And the point of it is to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And all we are, and all we are required to do, is to be good little termites, good little bees. We're supposed to just pollinate and make the hive grow bigger. And the way we do that is by loving actively. And if we can, even better, we can go one step further and we can help to build collective dreams of love, which is exactly what you guys are doing right now. And that is it. That is all we are required to do. Life, that simple, truly that simple. I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then I sort of looked behind me and I saw my body um, on the uh, gurney and... <laughs> If you go to hospital, take a friend. Luckily, Ileana, who runs our program, standing in the um, back of the room there, happened to see that I'd gone blue, happened to see that I wasn't breathing anymore, happened to call the chaps to come in with the oxygen mask and the chesty, thumpy thing. And um, back I came, fortunately. But I can tell you, do not wait. You don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes from now. Do not Wait, you drive your car out there onto the freeway. Do it now. 
dreams, love. It's the only thing that matters. And all of us are in an excellent position not to become distracted by silly stuff. What do other people think of us? Am I rich enough? Am I climbing the corporate ladder well enough? Any of these things, they don't really matter. They matter this much. The stuff that really matters is what you guys are doing. All right. I'd like you to watch a little bit of our story, and then I'm going to tell you about what we did and how we did it and where we're at now. Could we put it on? It's going to come up on the screen here. In April 2004, my son Rowan was diagnosed with autism. The feeling was like being hit across the face with a baseball bat. Our lives became clogged under a mountain of conflicting information on the disorder. He tried everything. He didn't speak to us. One day, he ran away from me and ran right up to a horse called Betsy. The moment I put Rowan on Betsy's back, he began to speak. He's a nice horse. As Rowan began to open up to me for the first time, a light bulb went on in my head. Was there a place on earth that combined healing with horses? Mongolia. This is a story about how as a family, we did something crazy. How we ended up going halfway across the world in search of a miracle. Exactly Ron's vision of Mongolia. We're going to go up a several thousand foot mountain and perform a four hour ritual with shamans. Isn't that what all families do? Sometimes I think he's like leaping forward and sometimes it's like he's totally regressive. I couldn't help wondering did I really have his best interest at heart here? I don't know how useful it is to think of us as normal and Rowan as the sick one. Something happened. Rome began laughing, giggling. We were together again as a family. to listen to what interested him above all else. But we're on to something good here. So, that's where our autism adventure took us. Thank you. We went to Mongolia. I rode across Mongolia with my autistic boy. He was incontinent, tantruming, but learned to speak in front of me in the saddle. Something shifted for him on the back of a horse, outside in nature. I simply followed my child. I'd always been a horse guy, grown up with horses, and suddenly the skills which I'd been acquiring for the last 25 years came to my rescue. The reason we ended up in Mongolia was because I have several careers. I'm a journalist by trade. I fell into human rights work. I work a lot in Africa, because my family is originally from Africa. We're white colonial Africans. I work with traditional hunting and gathering tribes on getting legal title to their ancestral lands. It's a funny old job. And I had to bring a delegation of Bushmen hunting and gathering peoples to the United Nations in the same year that my son was diagnosed with autism. And the same year he met Betsy the horse and started talking. And some of the guys on this delegation that I had to bring over were trained traditional healers in their culture. And it's really a process of prayer. I had seen this a lot growing up partly in Africa and also being in these kinds of situations. So it wasn't a great mental or cultural leap for me to think, why don't we give that a try? when a couple of these guys said, you know, we could do a little work with your son, let's see what happens. Because it couldn't harm him, all it is is prayer. So it's 
Have at it. Go for it. And to my amazement and gratification, for the four or five days that my son was with these guys, he began to lose some of his most dysfunctional behaviors. He fell back into them after they went home. But I couldn't help but think, okay, radical and positive reaction to the horse. Radical and positive reaction to these sham shamanic healers. Middling reactions to all the many orthodox therapies I'm trying. And I could bore you for three hours about every single therapy we tried. But suffice to say, we did the lot. And I thought, is there a place that combines these two things? It's not Africa. That's not a horse culture. It's not here because it's not where that kind of healing comes from. Where does the horse come from? The horse comes from Mongolia. That's where it evolved. Let's go there to the source. And they have a really strong system of this kind of healing. Total gut feeling. Crazy idea. I fielded it to Rowan's mum. She said, that's a terrible idea, Rupert. We, our lives are already incredibly stressful. Um, just going to the supermarket's incredibly stressful. We're somehow going to keep this tantruming autistic kid on a horse across Mongolia. No, no. Plus, she doesn't like horses. I'm the chick in the family. However, in a weird way, by that logic, I said, you know, because it's so stressful to go to the supermarket, we might as well go to Mongolia. We thought about it for about two years. We backed off. I think we both thought the other one with hope that it had gone away. But eventually, she thought, you know what, why not? And she actually joked. She said, for me, it's win-win. Because if it all goes to hell in a handbasket, I can say, I told you so forever. And if, it, and if it works, then great. So off we went. And I won't say it wasn't stressful, but it was the most miraculous thing to travel through that landscape, which looks like Montana or Wyoming before the Europeans showed up. And to finally end up in those mountains in, northern, in, in southern Siberia, where the reindeer herders live. These are people who ride on reindeer. These are people who live through reindeer. It's like, it's like going to a fairy tale. It's absolutely extraordinary. And the shaman there worked on my son for about three days, just prayer and song. And at the end, he said, OK, Rowan's autism is going to get gradually better. But the stuff that really drives you crazy, the incontinence, the tantruming, the inability to make friends, these things will end sort of now. And I was like, really? I mean, I'm, pre I'm fairly skeptical. Just because I do crazy things doesn't mean I don't have a healthy skepticism. I'm a journalist at the end of the day. But we rode down that mountain. And about 27 hours after we left the shaman, Rowan did his first intentional poo and cleaned himself. Absolutely amazing. You guys know what I'm talking about. It was like watching England win the World Cup, which will never happen. So it's better. And between the two weeks it took for us to make it from that river back to here, where we lived, about two weeks, we counted six tantrums, only six tantrums of any note. And normally that would have been maybe a day's worth, or even half a day's worth if it was a bad day. And he got back and he started making friends with all the kids in the neighborhood. And he was not cured of his autism. There's no cure for autism. There doesn't need to be a cure for autism. Autism's a perfectly valid way of being. There's plenty of people out there who do just fine who are autistic. Plenty of people who do just fine with every kind of special needs thing. But his quality of life and our quality of life went up so amazingly. So then I got curious. I thought, well, is it just my son who has this reaction to horses and nature like this, or is it other kids? So we started running unofficial playdates in the neighborhood for other kids on the spectrum and with other neuropsychiatric conditions. And we found an almost universal response. And we founded a charity called the Horse Boy Foundation. And we opened the little ranch and center. And now we travel all over the world training people to do what we do. It works. And we target the whole family. You guys know this, that when you're a special needs family, it's not good enough to just target the special needs kid. It's the entire family that one has to look at. One has to set up the right environment. Um, Mum is incredibly stressed. She probably hasn't slept in three years. Dad's working his butt off. 
if the family's still together, because 80% of the marriages cave, um, the parents frequently are beating themselves up because they feel they're not giving adequate attention to the siblings. Um, and all the time and money and emotional energy is going into the special needs child and so on. So we find out what are the dreams of the brothers and sisters when they come out. Maybe the sister wants to ride. Well, she gets to ride for free with us. And maybe the brother doesn't care for horses, but he loves soccer and martial arts. Well, we'll hire a semi-pro to come in and work with that boy so that the doors to their dreams fly open because of their sibling's condition, not in spite of their sibling's condition. This is very, very important. And the quality of life for the family as a whole goes up enormously. And for that reason, we don't charge families a penny if they are within Central Texas to come through our gate. It's all free. Because you guys know how it is. I'm sure quite a few of you thought about the cost of the gas to get here. Because we all know that special needs life is not cheap. It's not cheap at all. So I'd rather go out and raise money elsewhere so that I can offer a service for free to the families that need it. And here we are. My own life, I thought, had kind of ended with the diagnosis. I'm a journalist who travels all over the world. I lived half my life in Africa. I love adventure. I'd even stopped riding because I thought my son was not safe around horses. And riding is the principal pleasure in life for me. My son took me back to horses. It was him who went to the horse. It wasn't my idea. My son, because of him, we went across Mongolia. We wrote a book. We made a film. We cheekily submitted that film to Sundance, the festival. It got picked up. It went to cinemas. It went to television in 30 countries. We could not have predicted this. We put the thing together ourselves on a computer. Because of that, a producer at Sundance asked me what other ideas I had in my head, and I fessed up to a couple of ideas I'd had floating about since adolescence. He said, put them on a piece of paper. I did. He hired me to write the script. It's the same group that made Lord of the Rings. All because of following my son's autism. Not trying to keep the autism over here and keep my career going over here. I was willing to give up the whole thing for him. And he led me back to this. I think that all of our children are what I call dream whisperers. Are you all familiar with that idea of the dream catcher, yes? With that the, the, the thing in the poop and the... The question is, what do you do with the dream once you've caught it? You've got to gentle it. You've got to tame it. You've got to whisper it so you can ride it to its fruition. You can only do that, I think, if you're in service. And by putting our dreams into the service of those a little bit more vulnerable than ourselves, our own dreams come true. And because of that, we then have the gas in our tank to keep doing what we need to keep doing for the rest of our time on this planet. And we can no longer discount anything. I use Western medicine. I also take my son to see shamans. I'm completely practical. I wouldn't rule out any single option. If it's a possibility of an adventure or something that might work that will help my son, I will do it. I'm going to read you something now, just before I close, from the words of one of these shamans. Something I want you to consider is that when you go to these strange parts of the world, some of which are right here in North America, by the way. I've taken my son onto the Navajo Reservation, for example, for healings. You tend to notice that the people who are the healers in these communities exhibit neuropsychiatric and special needs conditions, often to the extent that if they lived in our society, they would be institutionalized. Yet, in those societies, it's regarded as a job qualification. And these societies are much more practical and survival-based than our own. They don't have trucks with air conditioning. 
They don't have access to a clinic. If they fall down and break their leg or get bitten by a snake or go mad or all that sort of thing, that happens to people. They've got to figure out ways to make it work right there. Yet they're marginalized, the people who would be marginalized in our society, in their society, have jobs, families, wife and kids, fully integrated. So this is the words of a healer, a Bushman hunter-gatherer healer in Botswana, Southern Africa, who I know very well, called Besa. And Besa is autistic. Besa doesn't look you in the eye. Besa flaps and he jumps around and he does all those stims and he doesn't really speak that straightforwardly a lot of the time. This is what he said. And this is his experience of when he's in the altered state of consciousness, what you call a trance, if you like, when he's doing his healing. If he wanted to heal, he said, he would fly abroad as a bird. He would find the spirit of the sick one lying down, resting in the sunlit bush. He would hop onto their back, lightly so as not to disturb them, and perch there, singing, until he had sung the sickness out of them. The person would feel the light bird's presence on their back and smile. And when he felt that smile, Bessa could go back to his own body and rest. Sometimes he would climb the rope to another place, a shadow land where the spirits of those who caused sickness wandered, blundering about in the darkness of their own creation. When he found them, he would confront them, demand the truth, an admission of wrongdoing from their spirit to his, and in their utterance of that wrong, their bad work would be undone. And sometimes, if he needed to, he could send his spirit out on mischief, not to kill, which was forbidden, that there were times he wanted to. But for this he became a lion or a leopard, a lion to hunt, maybe run off someone's cattle. Leopard was better though, quicker, smarter. When he went abroad like this, he would simply go, making sure nobody but those closest to him knew that he had gone. And when he came back, he would be tired beyond measure. Now, he said, tell me again why you've come. At the time, I thought I was going there as a journalist to find out about his people's attempts to try and get their land back. They got their land back against all odds. They won the largest land claim in African history in 2006. We still field the lawyers for them every year. Dreams come true. It's the most important thing. So I have one thing that I want to leave you guys with, and it's the only pertinent question. It's this. What are your dreams. You may have forgotten, because we know what happens to dreams. They tend to get pooped on, broken up, and buried. But that's actually a fertilization process. And when they're covered like that, they put down roots. And all you have to do is pour in the water on them, and they come back up way stronger than before. So if you've forgotten, and you may have, because the experiences of life and despair may have made you turn away from your dreams like this. And it's only natural. And everybody goes through a part of their life where they do that. When you go to bed tonight, ask yourself, what are my dreams? If you've forgotten, you'll be sitting in traffic 24 hours or 36 hours after you ask that question, and it will go like this. Bubble, 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 bubble. Ping! Oh, yeah. That was it. And almost immediately will come a pain reaction where you go, oh, but I can't have it. But this time, the rules are different. This time, you can have it. This time, you will have it. You guys are all class A human beings, or you wouldn't be in this room. You are already in service. You've already put your dreams into the service of the dreams of people more vulnerable than yourself. For that reason, your own dreams are even in the process of coming true right now. And I look forward to coming back in a year or so 
finding out how some of those dreams are starting to come true. So dream and dream hard. Because that's what our kids need us to do. That's what I got first, thank you. About whether or not this good effect that we were finding through the work with the horses and out in nature was specific just to my son, or was there going to be some translatable result across the board? I started a little center up in Elgin, Texas, where we live, which is right outside of Austin. And we started running unofficial playdates in the region for other families with any sort of neuropsychiatric thing going on. It didn't necessarily have to be autism. And we found that, yes, there was a pretty general response from these kids. And um, at first, I didn't really know what was going on. I just kept doing what I was doing. But I found that specifically, when you were riding in the same saddle with the child, as much as possible at what the Western riders call the lope, and what we in England call the canter, that you would often get this euphoric response from the kids, followed by communication, verbal or otherwise. And this was so general that we started running camps for families. I was in England running our first camp, and a friend of mine who's an autism mum said, you know what, Rue, you should probably start training other people to do what you do. And I said, you know, you're right, because immediately our little center in Texas started to get overwhelmed with the number of people wanting to come in. And what I realized, and you guys know this, that with anything that's to do with cognitive awareness, you can't institutionalize it. It's very much a one-on-one -on -one based approach. And so you can't serve 500 kids a week in one center. You wouldn't want to do that. It would completely dilute the value of what you were doing. What you want is lots and lots and lots of little places, all serving a small number of families very, very well, rather than a few places serving a huge number of families in a mediocre fashion. It doesn't work that way. Well. So she said to me, okay, Rue, I've been observing you work, and I see it's very systematic what you do. And I, of course, I'm too vain, and I thought, no, I'm not a systematic kind of a guy. I'm an intuitive kind of a guy. So, no, no, it's all very intuitive. She said, no, Rupert, that's rubbish. You're just very lazy because you don't want to write it down. And she actually nailed it. And I was like, you, you're right, I am lazy. Um, so, right about that time, I teamed up with Ileana, who you can see in the back of the room there, who's the technical whiz, but she's also a horse whiz. And she and I were producing the horses together training the horses together that we were working with with the kids. And we sat down and thought, well, how do we really put this in a way that you could communicate to other people? And we realized that it was a very simple six-stage process. And it really didn't matter whether you were talking about autism or whether you were talking about ADD, ADHD, or whether you were talking about anxiety disorders, or whether you were talking about anything that had to do with the nervous system and the brain that pretty much you were going to get a response if you followed these six steps. So I want to take you through the six steps. You know that we work with horses, but I can tell you the horse is not the most important thing. The most important thing is the environment. If you set up the environment correctly, particularly the sensory environment, you will have success. If the environment is wrong, you will not have success. What is a good environment and what is a bad environment? A good environment has no bad sensory triggers. The easiest way to understand this is just indulge me. It's one of my little exercises again. Wet your finger and wave it around. Does it feel hot or cold? Cold, correct. Because as the water evaporates from your epidermis, it cools the epidermis and it tells your brain that. But what if a wrong switch got thrown? And what if instead of feeling cool, it felt like somebody held your finger to the burner of the hot stove? What would you do? You'd melt down, wouldn't you? You'd roll around, crashing on the ground, screaming. Again, the chaps in white coats would be here within 15 minutes, and they cart you off to the funny farm, and that would be it. 
this is what goes on for a lot of these kids. And if they're not going through a crisis like this, they're often going through this slow drip of trauma and anxiety and stress because the autistic brain, and a lot of special needs brains have this, has an overdeveloped amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that governs your fight, flight, and freeze response. I'll activate somebody's amygdala right now. Sherry, I'm going to activate your amygdala, of course. Okay, here I come. I'm going to make eye contact with you. Now, I'm going to hold your eye contact for just a little bit longer than is strictly comfortable. Doesn't feel good, does it? Now, I'm going to step into your space. Really starts to feel bad. And now, here I come. What she wants to do is this. Boom! And run away. And the reason she wants to do that is I press her amygdala. If you look in a dog's eye, it's too long. That sort of press the amygdala, the fight flight response. Horses very similar. Horses are an animal that solve their problems by running away. They're very overactive amygdalas. So we don't want to press that amygdala. There are some known triggers for this that can flip that sensory switch. Fluorescent strip lighting. If you've got it in your house, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of the halogen bulbs too. Massively stressful for the kids on the spectrum. Look at the places where you tend to see the meltdowns happen. Supermarkets, schools, airports, places like this. Massive fluorescent strip lights. Also, sadly, indoor riding arenas. If you come to our place, you won't see any fluorescent strip lights. We took them away. Loud machinery, the sound of an overly loud air conditioner or furnace can send them over the edge. Don't have anyone running the chainsaw or operating a leaf blower or a strimmer or that sort of thing if you want the kid to understand anything. Too distracting. A yappy dog, too distracting. A long-haired hippie going on and on and on into a microphone in an echoey space, too distracting. Shut me up immediately. Um, these things are important to know. Smells, too much perfume, cigarette smoke. Lots of testimony now coming in from adult autists. Cisco sitting over there is autistic and he works with us as a consultant explaining to parents what's going on from the inside. He will tell you about how impossible this was for him as a little kid. So you want to set up an environment where you take all of that stuff out and what you put in is what planet Earth provides naturally. Natural light, shade, trees, grass to roll around on, an environment they can go barefoot in. If they want to put stuff in their mouth, make sure everything is edible. So they can put plant your garden so everything is edible and inform them about what it is. This you can eat, this you can't eat. This is okay, this is not okay. In the early days of my son, I couldn't get him to understand the concepts of, say, toxicity of plants. But I could say, this is a daddy leaf, this is not a daddy leaf. And he got it. Over time, he learned to figure it out himself. I couldn't get greens into the boy, but he was putting stuff in his mouth. I figured out that if he ate all these wild greens, not only was he getting all these amazing nutrients, but he was learning to order his environment and understand it through what he could touch, taste, and feel. Studies have also shown, plenty of studies have shown, that if you take off your shoes, you immediately calm down. Human beings are not supposed to wear shoes. If you, when you go to the beach, you wear your shoes on the sand. No. And as soon as you go to the beach, you kick off your boots and you get your toes in the sand. Why? Why does that feel so good for we funky monkeys, homo sapiens sapiens? Because if you know the history of our species, we evolved where? In Africa. And where in Africa? On the coastal margin, what you call the ecotone, the meeting of ecosystems, which is always where the most food is, between the land and the water. So we are beach monkeys. So everything in us is genetically programmed to want to go to the beach. That's why we don't want to go down holes or up trees when we go on vacation. We want to go to the beach. So you follow what's good for most human beings. You take out all of the man-made stuff, and you have an environment that really, really works. Not just natural, though. It's also human. One of the things which all of us in this room know is that you cannot do it alone. When you become a special needs parent, you've got to have a team. You've got to have, in fact, a tribe. Human beings are tribal animals. 
This idea of the nuclear family in a subdivision with a privacy fence is all very well until a crisis of some kind hits. And that could be a banal crisis, like I can't start my car, or it could be a health crisis. But as soon as one of those crises hits, you've got to have some people around to help you out. If you haven't got them, you've got to create them. You've got to reach out and find those people who share the same interests, who are going to come in and back you up, exchange information, share knowledge, share physical health. Finally, also, animals. The best piece of advice I can ever give anyone is, if you haven't got any animals, get one. Get a dog. Oh, then people say, oh, but it's so much hassle to have a dog. You're a special needs parent. How much more hassle can it be? You know, And that dog will give all the sensory input, be the kid's protector, teach the kid's social skills, all without a therapist entering the room. If you do these things, you are going to set up an environment for success. Now, some people will say to me, oh, well, Rue, but the kid's got to learn to deal out there in the real world. How's it going to help him if I set up a special environment? The thing is, 90% of the time, that's where the kid is, is out in that real world coping. Can we not, 10% of the time, set up an environment in the child's favor? I'll give you an example. I train horses. My horses have to be able to come into environments like this and be safe. I don't train them here. I train them in an environment set up for a horse. And then I gradually introduce aspects of downtown until the horse, after 24 to 36 months, is ready to go and do that. If I didn't, there'd be an accident and someone would get hurt. It makes complete sense. We're just really talking common sense here. Let the kid be in an environment where you're not pressing that amygdala. And they're going to be much more able to receive, but more importantly, retain information. The brain is incredibly plastic. The nervous system is incredibly plastic. We know this. People come back from traumatic head injuries all the time. They come back from severe strokes all the time. But it's all about a lot of one-on-one -on -one therapies and approaches in an environment that the person finds congenial. All right. Talks a lot about environments. It's the most important thing. The rest of them you would please to know go a lot quicker. All right. Once we've set up the right environment with no bad sensory triggers and only good sensory triggers, then we work directly on the kid's nervous system. When my son first went to the horse, all he wanted to do was lay on her back like a big old couch. And all his stimming, the self-stimulatory activity, the rocking, the hyperactivity and all this stuff, the flapping stopped. And I had a different kid. I didn't know why. I just knew it was working. And then I started doing this with other kids, and I saw it working for them. And then I found out that it was to do with the calming of the nervous system. And I thought, what about these mums that come out that are all stressed? Maybe we should put them up on the horse and do that. And amazingly, they would chill right out. We found, I'll give you some examples. It's really simple work. We had one kid, I remember, on a camp who never slept for more than three hours in his life. He fell asleep up there. We managed to transfer him to a bed. Without him waking up, he slept 14 hours, and it changed his sleep patterns. The mums fall asleep up there. The dads fall asleep up there. Then we put them in a massage chair. And then if they're on maybe their fifth or sixth visit to us, then they can really relax, and they know their kids are happy on the trampoline and so on. They've got a lot of play equipment. We take them into one of the rooms that it's a quiet room with a day bed, and we lay them down, and we rock their spine like this, and we produce a feel-good hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is your friend. Cortisol, the stress hormone from that amygdala, is your enemy. You create the oxytocin like this, and she goes out like a light. Whoever does that for her, we've got to serve the whole family. Mum is the engine. Mum is the person down in the boiler room of the ship making sure everything is running correctly. We've got to put gas in her tank. It's not enough to just target the special needs kids. What about the siblings? Again, if I know that the daughter perhaps really wants to ride, then she has riding lessons with us on fabulous horses for free. And the brother, he gets his soccer, his martial arts, everything else he wants to do for free. So that it changes the relationship of the family to the special needs situation. It changes the relationship 
between the siblings, it changes the relationship to the issue. You get to the heart of the matter. This is all before we've ever really done anything. The environment, the sensory world. Okay, then our third of the six steps is what we call back riding. We get in the saddle with the child. It's an oversized western saddle. And we work as much as we can at the canter in rhythms that rock the hips. Things that rock your hips in rhythm make you produce the feel-good hormone oxytocin. Try it. That's why we sit in rocking chairs. That's why we like to dance, etc. And we don't just feel a localized pleasure when we do this. We feel a global sense of well-being. The reason is the oxytocin. Calms down all that anxiety. And if you think about what autism means, auto is a Greek word. It means the self. Automobile, machine that moves by itself. Automatic, something that moves by itself. Autism, selfism, locked within the self. The difficulty is the relationship with the exterior world. The horse carries us into the exterior world. There are also some other pieces of equipment we can use, like that. Rocking. Away we go. Hand over hand, pointing and identifying. There's mummy, M-O-M-M-Y. Point. If your kid's not pointing by 18 months, strong chance they're on the autism spectrum. It's the first perspective taking master. You help them with it. You do it. You put your hand over their hand and you point. And you do it again and again and again and again, tailoring it to their interests. You know that kid loves Thomas the Tank Engine? It's all about Thomas the Tank Engine out there. You put Thomases in the forest and you ride to them. They love it. Sooner or later, they'll go like that. And the brain has started to repattern itself. It works. It's amazing. It also helps to be married to a professor of psychology, developmental psychology at the University of Texas. I'm not alone in figuring this stuff out. Okay. So we've got some oxytocin going, we're out there exploring the world, we're doing the hand over hand pointing, we're repatterning the brain and the nervous system, and we're having fun. There's no therapy with a capital T going on. Most kids suffer from therapy fatigue with special needs kids. They're at school, then they got their speech therapy, they got their OT, they got their this, they got their that. They're, they're doing a 60 hour work week. Like an adult, they don't want that. They want to feel like they're coming out to their uncle's farm to have a good time. It's us who need to know what we're doing so well that it just feels like there's no therapy. It's all done by stealth. We're just having a good time, right, on this cool horse. Okay, so we're out there. What do we do next? Now it gets interesting. The next cognitive milestone that kids need to get is how to play, play rule-based games. And also basic perspective taking, like you're there and I'm here. And if I walk towards you, you get bigger, and now you're your full size. And if I walk away from you, you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller until I can squish your head. I can squish her head too. And those guys, I can do all in one go. But if I walk all the way up to you, we're heads the size of a watermelon, I can't squish it anymore. This stuff has to be taught to kids that are lacking cognitive awareness. You do it with them, you make it fun. On a horse, we can do it at speed, but you can also do it in one of those chairs. There's something else that goes on too when you sit in the saddle with a kid. If I'm leading the horse like this, I'm constantly looking back, trying to get eye-to-eye -eye feedback. So I'm pressing that amygdala. But if I sit behind the kid, I'm a voice in the child's ear. There is no resistance. The child doesn't feel they have to defend themselves against me. And I'm giving them deep pressure. But again, I could do it with this. I'm the voice in the ear right here, aren't I? And we could do hand over hand pointing and tailor everything to the kid in the chair here. It doesn't have to be a horse. I don't want people to think that to do horse boy method, You've got to be dependent on Rupert Isaacson with his horses. No, 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 no. I can teach you guys how to do this stuff in your living room, bouncing on the couch. It's all about understanding kinetics. So, we're doing these perspective-taking exercises. Next thing, here I am on the horse, and I just ride up to Dad. I've got the kid in front of me, I go, you're it, tag. And I run away on the horse. Oh, he's going to get us, he's going to get us, he's going to get us, he's it, he's it. The first game that kids play in the playground to pattern their brains for social stuff is tag. The second one is hide and seek. 
It's automatic for most kids. Guess what? Most of our sensorily challenged and cognitively challenged kids don't do it. They learn it by osmosis this way. They are not required to understand the rules of the game. What happens is after a certain point, they take control of the game. And it can take months. It doesn't matter because we're having fun. And then they'll say, he should tag her, she should tag her, and she should tag him. And boom, they've got it. It's absolutely amazing. Then you go do hide and seek. I hide over here. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, ready or not? Round I come. And we go finding people. So well, I can't see them. So how am I going to find them? Maybe I need to use something else, another sense. Perhaps my sense of smell. Maybe we're looking for Ileana, who comes from Germany. Well, what do they eat in Germany? Because how would I find her by smell? Maybe she ate something, or maybe she's going to have one of those gaseous exchanges that happen um, through the alimentary canal after the digestion of food. And what food would it be? And they eat a lot of sausage and beer. Oh, I can smell sausage and beer. It's, it's a German. I've introduced geography. I've introduced cuisine. I've introduced culture. I've done it through toilet humor, which always works. And I've introduced basics, physics and chemistry. And you grow it from there. I'm telling you guys, this stuff works. And it's so simple. You can do it on your shoulders with a kid. It doesn't have to be a horse. You can do it in the water. The ethic of this translates to our fifth and penultimate method, which is actual academics. We teach everything like that. How to read, math. Um, physics, biology, chemistry. Then we do it all in French. Why not? And you tend to find that in so many cases, the kids exceed the possibilities that you thought were there for them. And it makes you smarter and the siblings because we're doing it with the whole family as well. So the sister's learning French and physics as well, by the way. None of it is wasted time. What you've got to remember to do is never to put the kid on the spot. If you put the kid on the spot, by saying, asking them a question that they don't think they can answer, you press the amygdala again. And this time it's a, <gasps> it's a freeze response. So you always model the answer. You always give them the answer. So say, for example, um, I'm teaching geometry. And I say, look, that white line there goes like that. I think that's a right angle. Let's just, let's just be sure. Yeah, on the wall, so on my shoulders, there it is. Oh, yeah, look. We do that. That's a right angle. In fact, I've got a protractor in my back pocket. Oh, yeah, this thing's called a protractor, and it helps you measure an angle. No, 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 here we go. I don't say to the kid, so what's that? What will happen is after a certain amount of time, the kid will say, oh, that's a right angle. The ethic with teaching anything kinetically through movement is this. Drop it, do it, confirm it. Drop it into the conversation casually. Pique the kid's interest. Don't explain. Then do it physically, kinetically, with your body and the kid. Then how do you confirm it? How do you know when the kid has gotten it? Like you do with the tag when the kid starts to direct the game and so on. Treasure hunts. You do treasure hunts in the woods. And if you know what motivates that particular kid, let's say it's the Thomas the Tank Engine, it's all about intrinsic motivation. Not, if you do this boring thing, I will let you have a Thomas. It's like, let's go do the thing you already want to do, and let's roll the boring stuff in there so it's not even boring anymore. So here we are perhaps in the woods, and we're six months into the process, and we're treasure hunting, and they find a clue that says, at the oak tree 35 degrees to your right, there is an amazing Thomas toy. It's all yours. The kid now knows what an oak tree is, Different to an elm, different to a pine, different to whatever else is growing. He knows that he can eat the acorns if he, if he boils them enough so that the tannins go out, blah, blah, blah. And he picks up the protractor and he goes at 35 degrees and he gets his toys. It's confirmed that way without pressing the amygdala. It's amazing. It works. And you can tailor this to the most basic level stuff or the most high level stuff. It's all a matter of your imagination. We train people how to do this every day all over the world. It's so easy. And you don't need a horse, and you don't need a penguin, and you don't need a degree, and you don't need an elephant, although that would be nice. I think we're going to have an elephant, actually, in a couple of years. Um, you just need your imagination. Okay.
Finally, the kid gets too big for us to share the saddle. What are we going to do then? We use it a little, start using the horse a little bit like a chair. We drive the horse in front of us with a pair of long legs. And that way, I can still keep those really nice rhythms going. Doom, 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 like this. Center of gravity back under the rider, which rocks the hips and produces the oxytocin. I'm still behind the rider. But now my agenda is different. Now I'm trying to get them to teach me about what interests them. Right about the time that the kids are starting to do well, what often happens to them is they get sort of punished. And what I mean by that is they get sent to mainstream education. And it's no holy grail, mainstream education. Hands up everyone whose most cherished memories of their life to this date were their middle school and high school years now. Most of us had a pretty rough time. And it only taken us maybe 40 years of therapy to you know, get over some of those ill effects. And we are relatively psychologically robust. But people who are much more vulnerable tend to get bullied, tend to get ostracized. And we often see with the girls what starts to happen is the cutting and the eating disorders kick in right about then. And with the boys, it's the just getting closed in and getting on those video games. We can do something about this. If, the, if all that boy wants to do is play Grand Theft Auto, I'm all about Grand Theft Auto. He's up on that house. Of course, I've researched Grand Theft Auto. I want to know about the graphics. I want to know about the marketing. I want to know about the programming. I want to know the history of organized crime. I want to know all of this stuff. I want to know who the mafia are and were. I take interest in the very thing that everyone else is telling him he shouldn't be interested in, because that's where he's at. When he becomes confident that I'm genuinely interested, he will start to come out of his shell and teach me about what interests him. And he will find his voice. And finding your voice is the most important psychological survival tool that you can have. If you think about it, I told you I'm a journalist, right? About 20 years ago, I found myself in this situation in a country in Africa called Angola. I would, there was a civil war going on, and I found myself looking down an AK-47 held by a 15-year-old soldier. I had to talk him out of shooting. How? In order to do that, I had to understand that he had a point of view that was different to mine. I had to know what a point of view even was. I could squish your head from here. You see, you see me from there. You can squish my head from there. You build this stuff over years. When somebody can find their own voice, then they have the capacity to ask for help if they're in trouble. To say, please give me food, please give me shelter, um, please give me a mortgage, please give me a job. All the useful stuff that we need in life. Any kind of self-advocacy, from the most basic to the most elaborate, is going to influence that person's quality of life. I want to have Cisco talk to you for a minute or two. Cisco is autistic. I would say that Cisco has found self-advocacy. Would you just give us a couple of minutes of that before we wrap up? Sure. Uh, the most important thing to remember about self-advocacy is that it is, like any other skill, it takes practice. If the child is bragging to speak, you have to make them realize that they are not your adversary. So you have to encourage it. You have to just anything they say, you know, say, you know, maybe that's not the right thing to say. If it isn't, that is. And so you give them alternatives. You can't say that's wrong, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. But the important thing to remember is as they practice it, they are going to get better. I mean, 10 years ago, I couldn't have done this. F uh, 15 years ago, well, I was a baby back then, but mm -hmm. the idea is self advocacy is an important skill and it's a necessary skill for everybody. And in anything with these sensory processing disorders and anything with cognitive disorders, they are going to be slow at it. And also, another thing is, humanity shuns difference. This is a common theme of humanity. And in anything that is different, they are going to face more opposition, especially in these cognitive processing disorders where they appear different in behavior, but not in, uh, in appearance. Well, in some of these people in appearance as well, but especially when they appear, when they behave different, but not appear different. This makes all sorts of cognitive distance in people that are relatively robust psychologically. Think about when a foreigner comes in from another country. This is the autistic experience in every country. You know, one of my things I did when I was 20 was I went to England for a holiday for a week. 
I realize, wait, I feel no different here than I feel in America. In fact, I feel better here because I'm not the autistic anymore. I'm just the American. And that's when I realized autism, in a lot of ways, and in a lot of these centers across the world, is like being in a different culture. And I had to approach it as a diplomat would. And I think that's another valuable skill that self advocacy. It think of it as a form of diplomacy, not necessarily as something that's the right thing to do, or something that they have to do. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, you know, feel free to find me. But otherwise, I'm going to just going to let Rupert finish, unless you were done. Just wrap up. Please give Cisco a hand. I want. To, uh, what Cisco is too modest to tell you is that he wasn't always doing as great as he's doing now. But he has his own car, he has his own job, he has his own house, and he's a paid consultant from Horseboy Foundation. We engage his professional services to tell parents that are coming out to us what it's like from the inside, advise them, help them, translate for them, if you will. We have to operate like a tribe. This is very important. And we want to get to the point where people can advocate for themselves. Because we have to advocate for us, and we have to advocate for our children. So we want to create a culture of self-advocacy within the families, because the siblings need to learn how to do it. We have higher stakes than the average family out there. So that's horse boy method. We've got the horse side of it. We also have the non-horse side of it. And we're starting to teach people more and more the non-horse side of it. And it's a basic, if you like, homeschooling technique called horse boy learning. It's those six steps. The right environment, the sensory work, paying attention to that, out into the world, using movement, the perspective taking and rule-based games, then the academics and finally the self-advocacy. And I promise you guys, you can do this in your living room. The next time your kid is bouncing on the sofa, you can say to that kid, stop bouncing on the sofa. Or you could set yourself a challenge and say, can I teach math while we do this? And you can accept that you might have to replace the sofa in two years, but it's fun to bounce on the sofa. We all actually want to bounce on the sofa. Our kids tend to remind us about what it is we really want to do, not what we feel we have to do. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts of being the kinds of families that we are. So if you want to know more about this, we do have a website. It's called horseboyworld.com. You can pick up little flyers over there at the table. You can come visit us at our ranch, but there's a lot online that you can find that we do. We go all over the world all the time. We train people in other languages. We train people in other countries. Because it ain't rocket science, thank God, because you see the color of my hair. Um, but sadly, it is true. And my brain is only slightly larger than that of a squirrel's. So if I can do it, I know anyone can. And thank you so much for your attention, guys.